My gosh, God moved every service. He operated every service. He flowed every time they got together. And when they got together, they got together in prayer, and they got together in the Word, they got together in communion. They came together for that anointing, for that presence of God, to be strengthened by God, to be equipped by God, to learn how to grow in God. The Spirit of God is that which operates and hovers in and over the believer. That's you and I. It's an ever-powerful, present person of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts chapter 3, we see these guys, this is a tuning in. The Spirit of God moves in. And the goal of the anointing of the Spirit of God not only is to demonstrate God, but is to reveal the lordship and the power of Jesus Christ and reveal the faith that we get when the Spirit of God operates in you, the faith that allows you to exercise whatever God is saying. Somebody say amen to that. The faith that God puts in you. When the Spirit of God is moving on your life and the Holy Spirit is walking in your life, you begin to operate by the Spirit of God. You begin to listen to what He's saying. You are directed by Him and you're listening to Him and you begin to understand that He is moving in directions and you know who to pray with, how to pray with, which way to move because the Spirit of God is personal and present in His operation in your life. That's His delight and that's His desire. So we got to realize that, that we see this thing in the book of Acts in chapter 3. It talks about Peter and John going up together to the temple at the third hour, the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, sorry, sorry, the ninth hour. They were going up already under the presence and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Every time you're walking as a believer, you've got a hunger. Every day, Lord, I want to clothe myself with the presence of God. I want to put on the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I want to put on the armor of God. I want to listen and be led. Holy Spirit, this is the intimate relationship and the fellowship that I have. This is God operating in my life. The Spirit of God's been given to the believer to walk by the authority and the anointing, to move and operate by the anointing, to see the kingdom of God advance because of the anointing. Somebody say amen to that. There's got to be a hunger and a desperation. I want more of God. I want the Spirit of God operating. I want to know Him. I want to have the fellowship with Him. I want to understand His nudging and His movement and how He's operating. These guys are going up to the temple for prayer. They're walking by the leading of the Holy Spirit. See, in the, in the church, this was brand new. This was explosive power when the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost. They had no idea what was going to happen when they got together in that upper room. All they knew was that Jesus just kept saying, it's expedient that I go. Because if I do not go, the Spirit of God does not come. But if I go, then the Comforter will come. And they did not understand. They had no idea, but he knew what would take place in the transformation when the Holy Spirit of God would suddenly descend from heaven and take his abode within their life. The third person of the Trinity. Stepping in and moving in and on their life. Filling them from the sole of their feet to the crown of their head. The Spirit of God right there to reveal all that Jesus is, all that the Father is. Bring all things back to remembrance. It's a powerful, intimate relationship. That's the difference between the Christian and any other religion. You have the intimate fellowship with the Holy Spirit. God has given him to us so we can walk in the authority because greater now is he, the Spirit of God, that is in you, right? Isn't what the Bible says? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's because you've got the Holy Spirit of God operating in you. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, Ephesians tells us, is the same one that walks in you. That's the same Holy Spirit that descended on Jesus. That's the same Holy Spirit that hovered over all of the deep. And when God began to speak, the Spirit of God began to operate. That's the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus out of that grave. That's the same Holy Spirit that fell on the day of Pentecost, the same one that's operating on the body of Christ, on the believer now, that wants to fill you with the same relationship, same revelation, same anointing, same authority. God has not changed for you and I to have that intimate fellowship. So these guys are going up to this prayer meeting. They're going up in the presence and in the authority and in the anointing of the Holy Spirit because that's what they had longed for. This was the promise. John the Baptist said, my gosh, I baptize you with water for repentance, but there's coming, there's coming one mightier than I whose shoes I'm not willing to even unlash, who will baptize you in the Spirit of God and with fire. There is, there is something coming that God is delighted all the way back from Genesis when man lost that Shekinah presence of God. That's what God's been hungry for to get you back into this powerful intimate relationship 
with the third person of the Trinity, the person of the Holy Spirit, dwelling in you to reveal everything about Jesus to you and to bring the authority of his kingdom operating about you. Now understand, the Spirit of God is to reveal the Jesus that is ascended to the right hand of power. He's revealing to you the Jesus that is crowned with glory and majesty. He's revealing the Jesus that now has got, has got the eyes of fire and, and seven stars in his hand. He's revealing the one that is victorious and mighty. He reveals Jesus to us as who he is. He is the king of all kings. His crown is a crown of thrones, of dominions, and all the kingdoms of the world. He is king and God, and that's what the Spirit of God is revealing to you. He wants you to reveal to you the king of power, the one who's overcome. And that's what's operating in the disciples, in the early church. And the church is seeing this presence of God and seeing the power of God. And when these guys are coming together, they're walking under that anointing. Somebody say the anointing. anointing. Say the anointing. Anointing. Say the presence of God and the anointing. This is what they're walking in. This is what they're operating in. This is is what's moving. They're living moment by moment. Everything they're doing, they got the presence of God operating in their life. You don't put the Spirit of God in a box or in the closet. You don't put them in a drawer when you leave your house. You get up in the morning, you got the presence of God wanting to walk in. The Spirit of God wants to have an intimate fellowship with you. He wants to guide you and direct you. He to close you with the fire of God and the grace of Christ. He wants to clothe you with the armor of God and the Lordship of Jesus. So these guys are heading off to the prayer. Something is taking place. So they're already under the anointing. Can you imagine? Already on, you got to understand, already under the anointing of God. God's already moving. The presence of God is already there. You got you to fathom God's presence already moving on them and operating. At the same time, something is taking place at the temple where they're going to go. As they're heading off the prayer, the Bible says, and there was a man who's been lame from his mother's womb. The guy's a cripple. Somebody say cripple. The guy's been a cripple. Not part of his life. Not some of his life, but all of his life. The man has never walked. His legs are curled up underneath him. They're atrophied. They have no power. There's nothing there. And he's been a layman all of his life. He's been used to being carried around or having to pull himself around by his hands. He's been a beggar from a kid. He has known no other life. And these guys are heading up to the temple. This man who's been carried by people. Every day they would bring him to the temple and they would drop him off for the day and there he would sit the whole day and he would beg for money and alms from the people as they would go into the temple. Kind of like the guy standing on the side of the road always looking for something as if this guy was legit. He had no legs that were useful. There was no program for him. So he was always having to beg for a little coin or a piece of bread or some food. Now understanding, the anointing of God is getting ready to meet something that seems insurmountable. The presence and the power of God is about to reveal the victory of Jesus Christ. Remember, the Spirit of God moving in you and through you is demonstrating and revealing the victorious King far above all principalities and power. All the things of the world are under his feet. Been given dominion over all things, all of creation. The authority to operate. Jesus is the victorious king. And the spirit of God wants to demonstrate the victory. Somebody say the victory. victory. Say the victory. victory. He wants to demonstrate it here. He wants to demonstrate it in and through you. He wants to demonstrate the victory in and through you. The Spirit of God wants to reveal the same Jesus to you that these guys were walking in. He wants wants you to know who he is. He wants to open the word and bring those revelations to you. So as you walk your day, you got a stronger walk of faith and you begin to discern the nudging of God. Well, these guys are heading up and this guy is there and he's, and he's asking for, and he's begging, and he's begging, and as Peter and John approach him, I guarantee you, the anointing of God came down all over them. And when you sense the anointing of God, you know God is up to something. Somebody say up to something. The impossible becomes possible when God's presence is allowed to arrive on the scene. The impossible becomes possible when when God's presence is allowed to arrive on the scene. Because remember, all the natural things are now controlled by the supernatural, not the other way around. And the king who was resurrection life and victory power and healing anointing is about to run right into someone who was lame and the lameness is about to be confronted by the power of God. 
It doesn't matter how long he's been that way. It doesn't matter because out of eternity, God's about to show up with the glory of the creator. And the creator is about to operate creative power on this man's life. What Jesus died for, what he paid for, was full restoration, complete wholeness and soundness. And that anointing is always flowing as demonstrated by the Spirit of God. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. You need Jesus and the Spirit of God operating in your life to bring that liberation and that deliverance. You can touch the hem of the garment of the king and receive whatever you need from God. There is no lack in him. So when they see him, he's looking at them, and they're going to begin to beg, and the anointing of God just moves all over. They know, Listen, when the anointing of God comes down on you, you know God, is, God begins to point something out. He be, I mean, God is pointing. Somebody say God is pointing. That anointing is pointing. The Spirit of God is pointing. He's telling you exactly. There's a move of God on you. There's an anointing, and God is moving towards something, and he instantly starts dropping into you exactly what he's about to do. And when, when God begins to tell you what to do and who to pray for, you know he's got them in his sights. And suddenly that anointing came down. In the natural, that's something that's impossible. But when the anointing comes down, the impossibility flies out the window because now you know the king of glory, the spirit of God, is now operating on you and he's about to demonstrate victory power. He's about to demonstrate his authority over hell. He's about to demonstrate his authority over disease and sickness and brokenness. He's about to demonstrate the king who's going to release all that are oppressed of the devil. And this man is in bondage and this man has been diseased. His legs are lame all of his life. He's not where God ever intended in creation and Jesus is about to fix it. Hallelujah. And when you come into the place with that expectation that, Lord, I'm ready. I want, I'm listening. Holy Spirit, I'm listening. There is somebody you want to touch. From the little thing to the biggest thing, it does not matter. When you, when you limit God, you limit God's ability to move in your life. But when you serve a limitless God, and you know that he is king above all things, and he is resurrection and resurrection life, and you know he can raise the dead, you know we can cast out devils. You know we can heal any sickness and disease. He can multiply whatever is needed. Then he can confront a crippling disease. When you, when you put no limits on God, then you allow God to be God. Because God is through his nature, his love, but God is through his nature, is limitless in his power. Limitless in his power. Hallelujah. So he said, look at us. The anointing was moving on him. And they looked at the man and the kingdom of God. I mean, the kingdom of God is moving on the life. They can, God is moving. I mean, it's exciting. I'm telling you, under the anointing, this is an exciting moment. This is an exciting moment. God's about to do something dramatic. And you don't want to miss it. The presence of God has suddenly come an explosive power. You know God's pointing something out, and you're reaching in with your faith, and your faith allows God. You're saying, Lord, I'm going to trust what the anointing is saying to me. I'm going to trust what the anointing is doing. I'm going to trust what's taking place. Lord, you just tell me, hallelujah, faith comes by God. Gift of faith comes by God, because that's what they needed to produce a miracle and everything they needed. The Spirit of God was given to go for it. Oh, somebody say Hallelujah. You want to be in that place. When well, God says, go for it. Fixing his eyes on him with John, verse 4, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them their attention, expecting to receive something from them. So he immediately puts the man in the right place where the Spirit of God is. Sometimes you're going to speak to somebody. Sometimes you're ministering to somebody. It's like, hold it, stop right there, look at me. This is what you're thinking, but this is what God is saying. Bring them right into the sphere of where you're at. Grab a hold of where their heart is and pull them to the level. We used to call it the gaze of faith. Brought the man from looking down for the natural thing, and they put a demand on him to look up into them, to look from the, at the gaze of faith, because he's about to release something into them at the level he possesses. Peter's got the anointing of God on him. And he pulls the man to a level of faith. Look at him. Silver and gold I do not have. But what I possess, oh, the authority of God that was on his life. The anointing of the Spirit of God that was there. What I possess, I give you now, he says, in the name 
of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now what he just does is he's declaring standing in the authority of the victory of the name above every single name. Paralysis, you've just met your match. Disease, you've just met your match. I'm standing in the authority of a greater name than anything you can name. And he says, standing in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hmm. Took him by the right hand and lifted him up and said, rise up and walk. The explosive power of God shot through them and hit that man. When he grabbed that man's hand, he's standing in the authority where he had the right to stand in. The anointing of God and the power of God like electricity must have shot right through him, right through that man, right down into his leg. As he picked him up, the man had never walked before. As he yanked him up onto his feet, he knew what to do. Spirit of God told him what to do because as he lifted him up, cur curved legs became straight. But there was no muscle that suddenly grew. Where bones had been twisted, they suddenly lined up. Where joints had been gone, they were suddenly formed and brought into the right place. As he reached down under the anointing of God and grabbed that man and pulled the power of God out of obedience, hit the place. Somebody say amen. The power of God hit the place. And he yanked that man up onto his feet because he knew what he had to do. He grabbed him and pulled him right up into his miracle. By the Spirit of God, right up into his miracle. Right up into the healing presence of God. Right up under the anointing. Pulled him right up into that place. I'd be excited. How about you? Talk about more than a round of applause for Jesus. The Bible says that man began to leap he never walked before in his life. Never walked before in his life. Never. We look at a lot of sicknesses, diseases, and we're very quick to pass a sentence on them. Look at a lot of people in their state, and we're quick to pass a sentence on them. Oh, that feel looks so bad. I wonder what they did to deserve that. In, in anything. Without Christ, any, any, any calamity can come on your life. Even with Christ, devils are going after your life. This is a spiritual battle between you and all the spirit of hell. And you're going after it. The power of God is going to drive the devil's kingdom out of people's lives. So you see people in a state, you see them in the state of where the devil's kingdom has brought them to. Do not write them off. You want to become sensitive to the anointing. Sensitive to the Holy Spirit. When God said begin to pray for somebody, you know, he's trying to move you from level of faith to level of faith to level of faith. Jesus is not satisfied with you being sick. He's not satisfied with you being broken. He's not satisfied with you being crippled. He's not satisfied with a calamity in your life. He's not satisfied. He came to deliver you from all of that. Let me say hallelujah. hallelujah. Otherwise, why pray for a miracle? Why even pray? Just to make somebody feel comfortable in their disease? How about understand that the anointing of God is to reveal Jesus Christ as the king who defeated it all at the power of his resurrection. He claimed it all back. He broke every, every curse has been defeated. He has washed it all away with his blood. He brought every principality and power under his feet that for every sickness, disease, demon, doesn't matter what it is, is now under the authority of the name of Jesus. And sometimes we're too afraid to use it. Now look what happens. Verse 8, so he leaped up, stood, and began to walk into the temple, walking, leaping, and praising. All the people saw him walking, and they knew that this, and they all knew this was the man who had been lame all of his life. Now let me give you some things here, because there's some powerful principles. We have the miracle. This is a miracle. Because this is a transformation of natural element. This isn't a healing. This is a miracle. So the anointing of faith had to come. The anointing of the word of miracle had to come. These things, God's kingdom had to operate above and beyond any realm to bring this man into total healing, just like bringing someone up from the dead. This is a miracle. But this is what God does. It's not an occasionally once a century. Jesus did miracles all the time. And we're supposed to walk in the greater realm under the authority of Jesus Christ. That kingdom is to continue operating through the believer. We miss the mark. 
When we throw the Holy Spirit out, we miss the mark. When we cease wanting to see the power of God, we miss the mark. We want to, when, we, when we cease to want to see God move through our lives, and when we do that because we're backing away ourselves, you kind of put yourself out there when you stop praying for people. You know what I mean? When you say you're going to stop praying for people, stop calling yourself a Christian in front of people, you kind of put yourself out there, and, that, and now you're marked. And somebody say amen to that. Amen. You need to be marked as a born-again believer because then you might as well live like one and act like one. Look at verse 11. As the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together in the place called Solomon's, and they were all greatly amazed. And, and when Peter saw it, he responded to the people... The Spirit of God is there to reveal Christ and the kingdom and the power of God that could be evident and operating in your life. He said, look, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why, why do you marvel? So in other words, this is nothing new to God. Hmm. This is an ordinary, think about it. A miracle is an ordinary event to God. A miracle is an ordinary event to God. It's... It puts a demand on us to want to get back to the place of miracles, doesn't it? It puts a demand on us to say, you know what? I'm not satisfied by not having miracles and not having healings and not having deliverance. My gosh, it puts you in a position that says, if miracle, if he says, what are you marveling at this? As though it's some mighty thing. I mean, why are you looking so intently at us? It's something we did. It's nothing to do with us. God did this. He identifies their covenant, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of our fathers has glorified his servant, Jesus. There it is. Jesus has been given the position. The Spirit of God is identifying Jesus now through Peter. Jesus has been glorified. He's not talking about the crucified Jesus, though he was. Beaten beyond recognition, his beard pulled from his face, nailed to a cross, his blood pouring down, a vile but a, but a most needed sacrifice for our sin. Not the Jesus that walked, but the Jesus that has been glorified. There's your power here. He paid the price, and now he's glorified. Seated at the right hand of the Father. All authority given to him in heaven and on earth releasing it to us by the Spirit of God, of his resurrection power. And it said he has been glorified. The world needs to know that Jesus has been glorified. He's been given the authority of the Father. He's been given the name above every name. Jesus has been glorified. Somebody say amen to that. Jesus, that no one, nobody else, nobody else has been glorified. Jesus has been glorified. And that's the power here. He said, the one that you delivered up, the one that you denied. He said, you denied the Holy One, verse 14. You denied the one that was just. Verse 15, but you killed the author and the originator of life. So Peter identifies Jesus as not only been glorified, but he is the author and the originator of life. He was there at creation. You just met the creator of the universe. Wow. Jesus. In the person of Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe. And God raised him from the dead. Seated him at his own right hand. Gave him dominion and authority. Verse 16, and his name, through faith in his name, his name and the faith that comes in his name, what his name now declares, the authority that is known as the faith and what his name means, faith in the name of God has made this man, notice the word strong, that's whole, that's sound, what you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given this man complete and perfect soundness in the presence of you all. The name of Jesus didn't kind of fix the guy. The name of Jesus totally healed the guy, gave him perfect soundness. I want you to go back into your Bible to a great book. I love this book with everything about me. The book of Joel. Go back to the book of Joel, chapter 2.
Peter would say, and the refreshing of God belongs to you. That's what he would say. He would say, repent therefore and be converted that your sins be blotted out so that the times of great refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. You are the sons of the prophets of the covenants of God. In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Peter just begins to tell them, this is a season of refreshing. Somebody say refreshing. Refreshing. refreshing adds the miracle power of God. This is a season of, res of refreshing, recovery, restoration, reconciliation. This is what the kingdom of God is about. This is what Jesus came for. His name is about restoring you completely. Somebody say completely. completely. Somebody say completely. completely. Say completely. 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 Restoration from the king. Jesus came to restore you completely, spirit, soul, and body. He went to war on your behalf, stood against all of hell, became your sin, sickness, sacrifice, and had the handwriting against you, the judgment wiped away and brought you into the kingdom and brought the covering of grace on you and has seated you with him in the heavenly realm. He came to reconcile and restore. And that's exactly what he did to that man. Now look at the book of Joel, chapter 2. Speaking of future things, verse 23. It says, Be glad, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. Somebody say rejoice. Rejoice. Gosh, the church ought to be the most excited people. We ought to be the most celebrating people. He talked earlier about how God is zealous for his own. Everything in the Old Testament... Everything about Zion and, and, and Israel is applicable to your life because you've been engrafted into the blessings and the promises. Say, I'm blessed with every promise that's been bought for me through Jesus Christ. I have the right to stand there, claim it, speak it. My gosh, be, Jesus showed the authority of the kingdom of his Father the power of the kingdom of peace when he commanded the calamity of the storm to be still and quiet. That was an anointing of peace. He used that anointing of the kingdom peace and confronted the storm and it was still. Such power, such authority with the kingdom of God and the word of God. He used that word, the kingdom of peace. Peace by the kingdom of his father. There's no, there's no disaster in heaven. There's no anxiousness in heaven. There's no fear in heaven. There is no death in heaven. There's no disease in heaven. The kingdom of God is filled with power and might and glory and the peace of God. And Jesus used it. Now here's what he says. Be glad and rejoice because he has given you the former rain faithfully. He will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the same month or in the first month in its season. This is one of the greatest scriptures speaking about the outpouring of the presence and the power of God. Joel is declaring what God is yet going to do. He's speaking into these, into these people's lives about a future event, about God's great reconciliation, God's great reign, God's outpouring, what God is going to do. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're standing in what God did. The flow of the grace of God is connecting to the early and the latter rain that they could only look at as something in the future. And we're walking in it in the present. It was the early and latter rain that fell on that day of Pentecost. The early and the latter rain and the anointing from it that was moving through these guys as they began to minister. And it has not changed. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is to dwell in the body of Christ. That same power and anointing and authority in every one of you. It's God's delight to fill you up with the victory. Can you imagine the kingdom of God in you? Doesn't matter what hell brought against you because the greater kingdom is operating the authority. Somebody get excited. The greater kingdom of God operating on the inside. Hell is pushed back because there is something, something and someone 
the Spirit of God and the kingdom of God, the revelation of the King of Jesus Christ. We draw from that nature and receive of the divine nature, of his heavenly ascended nature, of the victory he sits in now, of the overcoming authority. Jesus is now standing in now. That's of the, somebody get excited. That's the nature you're drawing from. You're drawing from the ascended nature. Oh my gosh, I'm telling you what, folks. We have so missed it as the body of Christ. We so sometimes step back and we, and we forget it. We don't know. And, 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 and here it is, 2 Peter chapter 1. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own divine nature, his own glory and virtue, by which we have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises. Now through these we may be partakers of the divine nature of God. Hallelujah. His promise is that I'm a partaker. I can draw from the divine nature of God. Somebody get excited. I can draw from the divine nature. What do I need? I can draw from it. This is from my life. This is from the inside, folks, from the sole of my feet to the crown of my head, of the nature of God. The explosive power in the church is when God's people have come together and they're drawing and they're receiving of the glory of the kingdom of the divine nature of God moving through your being. Instant deliverance. Healing because of the anointing and the presence of God. Of the nature in Jesus Christ, full recovery, full healing. And of that nature moving through your being, it can only confront everything out of order and drive it out and fix and restore. Oh, divine nature. The divine nature of God. Let me tell you here. Let's go back to Joel. Let me bring it down. How hungry we have to walk. Notice the early and the latter rain. Verse 24 of Joel chapter 2. And the threshing floor shall be filled with wheat. The wax shall overflow with a new wine. The provision of God and the abundance of God and the blessing of God. Listen, the early church wasn't walking quiet and dead. They were walking in such a victory shout. There was such an explosion. My gosh, that upper room exploded when the Spirit of God descended. Everybody, all the whole region heard the noise of God's presence in the upper room. They were worshiping. They were shouting. They were praising. They, my gosh, they were inundated. They were drunk on the presence of God. Jesus filled them with his nature, filled them with the Spirit of God. He came stumbling out of that place under the anointing of God and thousands got saved because of the moving power of the conviction of the Holy Ghost and the healing ministry exploded. This work, this word in the book of Acts chapter 3 is only one example of multitudes but the Spirit of God wanted to hone you into this. He wanted to hone you into a miracle that brought thousands more to the cross. A miracle that revealed where the faith came from, how the faith flowed. It was in Jesus, from Jesus, flowing from Jesus. Everything, because of his resurrected, ascended high priest office, from him is flowing everything of the nature of heaven. All that we need, why? Because he is the fullness of the Godhead. In him is everything, and we are receiving from him. No lack in the king. Verse 25, here's your miracle. I will restore to you the years. I'm your divine favor. I'm your healing. I'm your victory. I'm the curse breaker. I'm the devil stopper. I'm the years restore. What hell has stolen, what the devil has taken, I will give you back. I will restore and revive you. Dry bones, come back to life. The one who's lost the call of God, come back into the anointing of God. The one who has missed the things of heaven, God wants to abundantly bless you. The one who's walked away, God wants to restore you. The one who's been lost, God wants to find you and inundate you with his kingdom. God does not delight and desire in your lack. He delights in his abundance to fill your lack. Everything shall come back to you. And here it is, my favorite, verse 28. And this is what Peter used on the day of Pentecost. 
People don't think the Old Testament is applicable. Well, Peter thought it was. And that was the beginning of the church. That was New Testament. Peter quoted the Old Testament. Either he was wrong or he was right. When the power of God came down, I guess he was right. Quoted what God did and what he said. He said, and it shall come to pass that I will pour, somebody say pour, pour, not dab, not dip, not do, I'm going to pour of my Holy Spirit on how much flesh? All. all. That's everyone. That's what he's reaching. All flesh. The lavishing of the kingdom of God. The lavishing of the miracle of God. Peter said this anointing, this ministry, this, this understanding of the Spirit of God is for you, for your sons, for your daughters, for all that are far off. This is from God. It is for you. This pouring out of his anointing and his power, it's for all. And there is nothing in the, nothing in the book that says that it stops. You're living in the season of God's great outpouring. We need to stand and thirst for wave upon wave upon wave upon wave because he says, he says what's going to happen. He says, I'll pour up my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will begin to proclaim and prophesy the radical things command. Can you imagine the generation upon generation suddenly getting hit with the presence and the power of God and beginning to speak forth and utter the things of grace, the word of God to come to pass. That is radical. You want to scare a liberal? Pour the power of God on a generation. They will prophesy heaven and the word of God right against that vile spirit or they will drive it back. Come on, that's why he said it. Stand your feet in the house. Peter told them this is for you. Told them the refreshing is for you. You told them on the day of Pentecost, it's for you and your sons and your daughters. This is God moving. Not just on a few, but he's coming for everyone. He's coming for the generation. Hell wants the generations, but there is an authority, there is an anointing against every move of hell. That's the power of God to break the hold and the yokes and the bondages and to bring the authority of God to bring a generation under the conviction of God, filled with the power of God. There is no lack in him. Lift your hands up before the Lord in the house today.